if you have several programs sharing a machine, how can they do that? So this is what we talked about last class. As part of the history, we looked at where we went from batch processing, where you didn't share a processor, where you took turns. And we switched in the 1960s to multi-program, where instead of taking turns and having this very expensive hardware sitting around waiting to get data, you could now run other programs when you were waiting. So what's necessary to do that? So there are three different ways we might think about sharing a processor. Multiprogramming, as, as the first one that we talked about last time, if a program gets stuck, right, it gets stuck when it's waiting for data, a supervisor program will take over and pick some other program to run. That really means the same thing as non-preemptive multitasking. It's basically up to the program to say when its turn is done. With multiprogramming, you say your turn is done by requesting some data. With non-preemptive multitasking, well, there might be other ways that you decide you're done. But it's up to the programmer to decide it's done by doing something that lets the supervisor take over. The other kind of multitasking is what we call preemptive multitasking, where it's up to the supervisor to decide to let another program run. It's not up to the program that's running to say, I'm done and someone else can have it. Which one of those do we like better? Does it make a difference which one we have? Yeah. Preemptive can deal with misbehaving programs much better. Any other reasons? If it's, if it's non-preemptive and you want other programs to have a fair share, then that's more work for a programmer. If it's preemptive, it's up to the operating system to take care of that for you. If it's non-preemptive, you've got to write your program carefully. Are there any, uh, I should actually, on the other side, it's an advantage of preemptive. Are there any advantages of non-preemptive? So actually, first question. The operating systems that you're all running now, what are they? Probably they're all preemptive. Um, are there any places where you're using non-preemptive operating systems today? OK, good. So a dedicated server that's only run, running, do you have a concrete example in mind of a, a machine that's only running one thing where you'd like it to be non I guess if it's only ever running one thing, there's no, it's not multitasking at all. So that's not quite what we need. So it has to be running more than one thing for this to be an issue. Yeah. Good. Do you have a concrete example of something where you can't afford to let programs be interrupted? I guess some of you were in things that involve non-preemptive operating systems earlier today. Yeah. So the place where you, you really want non-preemptive is where you have strong real-time guarantees that you need. And then people mention this. So, so there are lots of places where that, that's still true today. Right? So we talked about in uh, a car that you've got lots of operating systems running. You really don't want your anti-lock braking program that figures out how to control the brakes to be preempted by some background process that does maintenance. That doesn't necessarily mean you need a, a completely non-preemptive operating system, although certainly the, the simplest thing is to have that. And there are lots of cases where if you're you know, programming avionics or a, a space probe or something like that, where it is worth having the programmers figure out the schedule that works and not allowing anything to take over for that. So it's up to the programs to, to desi design a schedule that works and not, you don't want to be interrupted. So there certainly are cases where that's a much, much better solution. The other big advantage of non-preemptive, it's a lot simpler. And it's probably more reliable. At least it's simpler to make it more reliable. If you're a preemptive operating system, all the programs have to be able to deal with the, the possibility of getting interrupted at any time. If you're non-preemptive, the only times that switches can happen are, are well-defined. OK, here's some operating systems. Which ones of these have preemptive multitasking? And there's a one-letter answer that is correct. Uh, it's not all of them, and that's more than one letter. So those are correct, but there's one more. So these two are preemptive. There's one more of those, which may be the most surprising one to some of you. Uh, Multics did not have preemption like this. So, so it, it did support multitasking, but it did not have, would do the non-preemptive multitasking, where it would only give the supervisor control when a program did some operation that, that would give the supervisor. At least the early versions of Multics did not have it. The answer is all the ones that end in X. Windows actually did have preemptive multitasking from version 
So uh, it had it much earlier. I, I, actually, my drawing here. So Mac did not have it in, in OS 9. It did have it in OS 10. So how would I prove or test if my machine running Mac OS 10 or OS X has preemptive multitasking? What are things you could do to, to determine if your machine has it? Even within sort of what might seem instant to humans, that doesn't necessarily prove that you have preemptive multitasking, because it could be that that program has total control until it does some operation that gives up control, and at that time it gets the signal. Right? And unless you knew something about the program, you don't know that it's being preempted. The fact that it appears to get the signal instantly as far as a, a human can see, unless you know something more about the program. Is there some program you could create where that test would give you a lot of confidence that you have preemptive multitasking? So what kind of program would we want to have in order to know that, that if the, the test of sending it a signal and seeing that it gets it works, that you know that it does have preemptive multitasking? Exactly, yeah. So the strategy, if we made a program that's an empty loop, or any program that's not doing any of these operations that give up control, right? so probably as long as you're not reading memory, you're not giving up control, or you're not doing any, any I.O. or any expensive operation. So this would be my, my one-line proof. I write my program that's an infinite loop. I'm pretty sure that that doesn't give up control if I have non-preemptive multitasking. And I run it, and if everything else on my machine stops, and there's no way I can do anything to get it back other than you know, unplugging or doing you know, some more dramatic thing, well, then I would have uh, non-preemptive. If I can stop it, then I have preemptive. Here's some other possible things that might indicate which one you have or be affected by which of these. If your computer crashes less than uh, one running OS 9, so OS X has preemptive, OS 9 doesn't, is that a symptom of having preemptive multitasking? Which kind of system would you expect to crash more? Does switching to preemptive multitasking reduce the number of crashes you would expect? So you're almost answering the second question as well. Right? So certainly, crashes, there's no reason that we would expect fewer crashes with preemptive. In fact, we probably would expect more. Right? There's more things that can go wrong when you have preemptive multitasking. It's certainly not going to reduce crashes. What it will reduce is when your machine hangs. You have to be, when I say crash, I mean your, your machine gets into to some broken state. Right? It's not hanging, it's blue screening or doing something, something else that is a crash. If you need to reboot it because it, it hung, well, that's exactly what we talked about our one-line proof. A system with non-preemptive multitasking, any program that's running that has a bug that goes in infinite loop that doesn't do any I.O. operations, that's going to cause a tank. Right? And you can't just kill that one program you got to reboot the machine. Right? So that's what would happen with Macs before OS X. They would, you know, because of someone by, by your program, get into a state where you had to reboot them. Someone asked that we should play an Eminem song. So this seems like the best opportunity. And I don't necessarily do everything students ask for, but when you ask for something reasonable like playing an Eminem song, um, I certainly should do that, especially when it's relevant. So when, when, when you're playing a video and it jitters, what's the main reason for that? Because if it doesn't play at all, that's probably not because of having either preemptive or non-preemptive. In this case, if it jitters, what's the reason going to be? That's really loud. Sorry. OK. So if it jitters now, what's the reason? It's probably the internet, right? It's probably that the packets that we're getting from YouTube are getting delayed because someone else is watching Gangnam Style or something else in the class, and that's interfering with my, my video. If I've already watched it lots of times and I've got all the packets, all the data locally, and it jitters, what's the cause for that? Well, so, so if it never can play things at the video quality that I'm trying to play, well, that might be I don't have a power enough, powerful enough machine. But if it can mostly play it and sometimes has jitter, um, it could be because it's reading it from the disk. But if it's got it all in memory, it's having jitter because the operating is preempting it and giving some task too much of the, that CPU slice that it needs to render that frame. If we had non-preemptive, we could have video players that say, 
I'm super important. I'm not going to let anything else take control of the machine because you want to see the video without any jitter. So there are things that we do frequently with computers today that suffer potentially because of having, having preemptive. So this is a maybe. Probably not the main reason in, in most cases, but in some cases it could be. And what about the last one? So the web server that you built for Palm Set 1, if you had that running and, and fired up a lot of browsers and made requests, could you tell if, it's, if your system has preemptive multitasking? What tests would you want to do? So can you tell if you just like started your server and, and made a lot of requests and they seem to all get, get responses? Good, yeah, you'd want to change, you know, if you made your code for serving a page, really slow. Right? So you could do something to make it take a lot longer to respond to each request, and then you could tell if you made some requests fast and some requests slow, if you had to always wait for the first request to finish before you could do the second request and get a response for that. Probably have to do a little bit to do a real good test of this, but you'd find that it is preemptive that you can have multiple, multiple requests running. You don't have to wait for the, the first request to finish to start the second one. How did Mac OS X end up with multitasking? So it went from OS 9 in December 2001 to the first version of OS X, which I guess that came out a little earlier, that did have preemptive multitasking. How did they make that change? Yeah. So they completely threw everything out. It's not a small change to make. You basically have to start over completely. So there's no real connection between those two. This is the, the early movie about Steve Jobs that came out. It probably, I haven't seen it, and I've heard it's really horrible. It probably doesn't answer it. But there is, there is a new movie that's supposed to come out probably later this year that is, is I'm more hopeful will answer this because it's by the guy who did the previous operating system movie. That You may have seen the one about virtual memory that came out a little over a year ago. Some of you have probably seen it. There was also some stuff about an application program, Facebook in it. But the key scene was about virtual memory. So this, this was uh, Aaron Sorkin, the social network. Um, if you missed the part about operating system in it, you should definitely watch it again. But it is from an interview about this upcoming movie and talking about how Steve Jobs went back to Next Step. The other nice quote in this interview, Sorkin's talking about trying to, uh, sorry, Steve Jobs is talking uh, was trying to recruit Sorkin to write a Pixar movie. Uh, Sorkin was saying, well, I, I don't know how to write animated characters. I only write sort of real people. And Steve Jobs' answer was that once you make them talk, they're not inanimate anymore. But I guess it wasn't enough to convince Sorkin to write a Pixar movie. This is the complex history of how OS X ended up with preemptive multitasking. So we started with the first Unix. You notice they changed the spelling. It was initially spelled to look more like Multex. And if you go down this path, it ended up becoming BSD, and then that evolved into Next Step, which was when Steve Jobs was kicked out of Apple, started Next, and the operating system that they were building at Next. Next didn't succeed much as a business, um, but did make some pretty fashionable computers. And there was at least one really important program that was built on the Next. Do you know what the, the really important program built on? Yeah, so the first web server and the first web browser were built on the next. You shouldn't power them down. 24 years before Problem Set 1 was due, Tim Berners-Lee had already finished it. He hadn't quite finished Problem Set 3 yet, so you have a chance to, to be ahead on that. This is sort of the history of how we got to Mac OS X and, and iOS, that not necessarily all the code ended up evolving this way, and the other path through Linux ended up in Android. But all of this is connected to Multix and, and Unix. It wasn't true 10 years ago, at least not 15 years ago, that most people are running preemptive operating systems. It is true today. But how is that even possible? Does it seem like it should be possible? So what has to happen for us to have a preemptive operating system? It has to be the case that when one program's running, some other program can interrupt it. But how does that other program interrupt it if it's not the one that's running? Do we need two processors? So we certainly want to give the illusion that all these programs are running and sharing a processor. But if we can only, let's assume we only have one core, which until somewhat recently was the case for most, most machines. Certainly all, all these operating systems work on single core machines. How do we have a program that's going to wake up, that's going to prevent another program from running? What, do we need something else or can we do this? All right, so we need something in the hardware that can prevent the program that's running from continuing and allow some other program to run. Right, we need something that's going to take over and let the supervisor program run. And this can't be another program, because we're assuming that that 
the first program is running on the processor. And we need something that's going to wake up the supervisor and let it start running. So we need some hardware to do that. So we need something that's going to trigger a switch between A and the supervisor. And then the supervisor is going to decide, well, now it's time for program B to run. But it's not up to B to trigger the switch to the supervisor. Right? If it was up to the program to do it, well, now that would be non-preemptive. Right? Then it's up to the program running to decide, oh, I'm going to let the supervisor run. We need something other than the program to make the supervisor run. So that has to be provided by the hardware to do that. And that's the alarm clock. That's the timer interrupt. It's going to go off at some time interval and say, it's now the supervisor's turn to run. And that requires special privileges up to the, so the hardware is sort of the most special privilege it can. And then the supervisor that runs is the next most special privilege. And you have to have special privileges to be able to decide what other programs run. Because if every program could decide that, then every program would just run as much as it wants. How frequently should this alarm clock go off? How often do we want to interrupt the program that's running and tell the supervisor it's the supervisor's turn? Do we want this to be as fast as possible? So one possibility is we, we want it as infrequently as possible. I guess then the question is, how infrequently is that? Right? So, so we want it both as frequently as possible and as infrequently as possible. If it's too infrequent, what goes wrong? Yeah, so if, if the timer interrupt is too infrequent, then there could be too long a gap between the times when the supervisor gets to decide which program runs. Right? So if, if we're trying to play our video, and our video has to render you know, 25 frames a second, so it's got to run at least 25 times a second, and some other program runs and the kernel timer interrupt is more than a 25th of a second, then we might miss a frame in our video. We want it frequently enough that if the super decides, you know, here's some program that needs to run at some, some frequent rate, it's going to get the chance to, to go off and run frequently enough. But we don't want it so frequent because there's a big cost to this. Right? Every time we interrupt one program, well, we've got to switch things out of memory. We've got to switch which program's running. We've got to decide, should we let that program continue or switch to another one? So we definitely don't want it to be too frequent. What would you guess it is on the machines that you're running today? Is it orders of nanoseconds, milliseconds, seconds? So it's, it's orders of um, milliseconds, right? So you don't want it. Seconds would definitely be too long, right? You couldn't watch videos if it was seconds. There are various ways to test it. So there's, there's a link to a program. So here I'm getting 4,000 hertz. So the kernel timer is going off 4,000 times in, in a second. So that means each time is 1 4,000th of a second. There's actually a Rust version of this that Will wrote last semester. That you can try and see what the kernel timer interrupt seems to be on your machine. Um, and you can often change it. Most OSs will give you. You can certainly change it if you hack the kernel code, but you can probably configure things if you want to change it as well. So we get these timer interrupts. When the supervisor runs, right, it gets to do two things. It gets to set the alarm clock when the next timer is going to go off. It doesn't always have to be the same. It could decide, well, I know A is some really important program that needs to render a video frame. I'm going to set the timer to be a little longer. Usually it sets the same time. And then it's going to switch to run that program. And then that program's going to run really loud. Sorry about that. But it wakes everyone up, so that's OK. I think it's going to happen again. Um, so this is definitely not to scale. Right? If this was to scale, you're wasting almost all your processor. Right. What it really should be to scale is here's the supervisor, here's the time slice probably going off the slide, and then a tiny little slice for the supervisor. You definitely don't want to be spending the majority of your time running the supervisor. Is there anyone who can interrupt the supervisor? So certainly the hardware can. Those of you running, so many of you have been running VirtualBox. How does that work? So you're running one operating system inside another. Do they both have kernel timers? Which one can interrupt the other one? So if the operating system you're running inside VirtualBox goes into some infinite loop, what happens to the rest of your machine? Good. Nothing should happen, right? Well, it's still using some resources, but basically the rest of your machine should continue to function normally. So that sounds like there's someone who can interrupt the supervisor. Either that or VirtualBox is a software-level software, software level emulator, which it's not, right? If it was a software-level emulator, everything would be really slow. But we need a supervisor of the supervisor, which modern processors have. And in uh, normal language, they usually call it a hypervisor. If you have an Intel processor after about 2005, it's got support for a level below the supervisor that can interrupt the supervisor. And this allows you to do virtualization and run an operating system on top of another one, because you can have two levels of interrupts. This idea, of course, goes back to Multics. 
as, as do most big ideas. Except for Multics didn't just have two levels, they had eight, eight levels. And they, they weren't using it for sort of virtualization the way you're using VirtualBox, but they were using it to sort of run programs with different levels of, of priority. What we're going to do for problem set two, problem set two is longer and more challenging than problem set one. You do have a little more time to do it, but definitely don't wait till too late to get started. And what you're going to do for problem set two is implement a shell. So a shell is the program that allows you to run other programs and manipulate other programs. Many of you have probably, at least if you're running a Mac or Linux, you're probably using the bash shell, um, hopefully fairly frequently. If you're running Windows, it doesn't have quite the same kind of a shell and people tend not to use it very much. But hopefully all of you have sort of used a shell and for problem set two, you're going to implement your own shell. 